that I, I want to welcome and thank you all. My name is Alina Serfati, and I'm here with Dr. Hilary Humans, who coordinates and moderates this series with me. Our guest speakers today are Dr. Paulo Lito from Brazil, <laughs> Dr. Yulia uh, Menelevski, and Dr. Rosemary Klecker, both from the US. The presentations today will be recorded and available on demand on the OCAD website, which is ocadmsk.com, and on the YouTube channel of the Radiology Society of Rio de Janeiro. If you want to join the OCAD community, consider registering on the OCAD website. It is super worth it, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> So this session will focus on major trauma, which is a new topic for us. The speakers will present their cases, and at the end, we will have a Q&A session. If you have questions at any time during the presentations, please put them in the chat box, and at the end, we will get back to them. Um, just a quick reminder, attendees have not been given the permission to screen record any of these presentations as they may contain material under copyright. An authorized recording use distribution and sale of this material without permission from the speaker is illegal. We thank you for your understanding and with that, I will kick off the session. I'm, I'm, I'm going to dictate this. No. <laughs> Hi, good morning, everybody. I'm Hillary Humans. Um, it is my great pleasure to introduce my good friend, Yulia Melanevsky, who completed her medical school training in St. Petersburg, Russia, <clears throat> and then her uh, radiology residency and musculoskeletal fellowship training, both at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in Boston, Massachusetts. She's currently an assistant professor at University of Alabama in Birmingham, and she's the MSK Fellowship Program Director there. Her interests include imaging trauma and orthopedic hardware, tumor imaging and intervention, and she's interested in adult education. We're a bunch of adults, Julia. Teach us something. Hi, thank you, Hillary, for uh, your kind introduction, and thank you, Aline, for inviting me to speak is in at this wonderful conference. Um, uh, I will present a case of major trauma today. Hopefully, hopefully we all will learn something. So the case, I have no disclosures, sadly, still no disclosures. Um, my case is about a 47 year old lady who uh, was transferred from the outside hospital. She got in the car wreck, but she was a restrained driver. She was driving 45 miles per hour and texting, and then she rear-ended other car. The airbag was deployed. Her labs were notable for cannabinoids, so she's probably smoking. She complained of chest pain and right ankle pain. So on the chest imaging, there was sternal and several rib fractures, which tells us the mechanism was probably very significant for this ankle trauma. The imaging was obtained, and uh, I don't know about your all's institution, but for us, standard views are not obtained originally. So the patient is basically thrown into the under the x-ray machine, and mystery views are obtained, though these are pretty good. So uh, what is wrong with this lady? The reports from ER radiologists are gonna look something like that. There's a displaced neck fracture dislocation and medial molecular fracture. But is that all that we can say about that? Let's start with the anatomy of the talus. Talus is my second favorite bone in the body because it is so unique and it has uh, few very interesting features. Talus is, majority of the talus is covered by hyaline cartilage because it contains severed articulations. Talus lacks any muscle or tendon attachments. 
So its blood supply, it is going to be extra osseous. Subtalar articulations uh, include posterior subtalar or talar calcaneal joint, and the posterior calcaneal facet is the largest. It is separated from anterior subtalar articulation by tarsal canal and sinus tarsi. It's going to be important a little bit later on because vascular supply, uh, vascular supply is going to pass through the sinus tarsi and tarsal canal. Some authors, some authors um, distinguish two facets of the uh, anterior subtalar joint and some even uh, some even call it the distinct medial uh, facet of the anterior subtalar articulation so we can we can all talk about it and argue about it sometimes they communicate and sometimes they don't so it's a terminology matter so very complex joint and of course talocrural uh, articulation is uh, uh, we have that uh, cranial see from the superior side. Taylor vascular anatomy, I got that diagram from, uh, from my article. So in summary, Taylor vascular supply can be, can be um, divided into three groups. So first, dorsolateral branches. Then from the posterior tibial artery branches, we have some vessels going on through the sinus tarsi and tarsal canal, um, and they're communicating with the coronal artery branches as well. So that's the second, that's the second source. And then there are separate branches to the medial tailor bone. So it's going to be uh, important later. As far as tailored neck fractures, the incidence varies really widely. You can find incidence of tailored neck fractures of from 5% to 50%, but this could be due to inconsistent definition of the tailored neck. By convention, most people call tailored neck fracture if the inferior fracture line is anterior to the uh, lateral process of the talus. So this is lateral process of the talus. This is our favorite posterior uh, facet. And then uh, the fracture line is going to be anterior. And of course, it's going to be the posterior to the talus neck. So if the fracture lines extend into the body, but there is a vertical line, we can apply the uh, fracture classifications for the tailor neck. How do tailor neck fractures occur? So you need a pretty significant mechanism of trauma to, uh, to have a tailor neck fracture. So in this paper from 1976, oh, but um, they uh, try to produce tailor neck fractures and so the ankle should be should be in the fixed position and the load should be axial and uh, dorsiflexion. Okay. It, this was initially described with, um, uh, with aviators or basically plane pilots um, with crashes and it was named aviator astragalus. Now, of course, there, there's not a lot of those and they are most common with MVC uh, and uh, major trauma. This can also occur from fall from significant heights. If you think about how the crashes occur and what we do if this occurs, the foot is usually placed on the pedal and our natural reflex is going to be to extend our knee. So this is how that occurs. And with increased force, they would produce a tailor neck fractures and then some non-alignments. Uh, classification of uh, tailor neck fractures. Uh, there are many classifications. The most commonly accepted one 
by Dr. Hawkins, who described it in 1970. And he described the, basically the first three groups of uh, fractures. Now, he was modified by Dr. Canale and Kelly a little bit later, and they described a fourth type. So let us see what we do with these fractures and how we tell them apart. Basically, if there is a non-displaced tailor neck fracture, that's Hawkins one. If there's a vertical tailor neck fracture and tailor calcaneal dislocation, that's Hawkins two. If there is a vertical tailor neck fracture and tibial tailor dislocation, that's Hawkins three. And then type four, all articulations of the talus are dislocated. So uh, type one fracture is uh, pretty straightforward. We won't spend a lot of time on that, but the risk of complications is gonna be low. Hawking's uh, two fractures, so you can see the tibial tailor joint remains congruent, but the uh, tailor calcaneal joints are dislocated and uh, you can see that it's the posterior facet that's dislocated. They are commonly, or I guess, they can be open and uh, very gruesome images. And so the rate of complications is uh, really high. Yeah. Hawkins three is when uh, both tibio Taylor and Taylor calcaneal joints are dislocated. The talus, uh, the body of the talus is often rotated and it gets stuck between the posterior margins of the tibia and the calcaneus. And often it can lead to the need for open reduction, or I guess intraoperative reduction and uh, external fixation. Now Hawking's four is a pretty rare finding. It's the case where you find the talus at the side of the road uh, pretty much, it, it's, it, it can be extruded in a, in a very bad way. So uh, the rate of osteonecrosis is very, very high. It should be 100% because all our means of blood supply are disrupted, both dorsolateral, right, and um, the inferior and even medial tailor body. There are no blood vessels for that. So rate of osteonecrosis will be 100% even if timely reduced. And um, and I I just wanted to ask the audience, so maybe you could put uh, your experiences in the chat, but even though anecdotally, personally, I see osteonecrosis in a lot of these cases, but there's no collapse and the fracture heals pretty well. So it is something that um, I'm always wondering about how could something like that actually heal? So whenever you see a tailored neck fracture, we should look for additional findings. And additional findings could include tendon tears and entrapment, vascular and ligamentous injury, I put a CML, and retinacular avulsion fractures. They say medial is more common, but uh, anecdotally, again, I see more lateral retinacular avulsion fractures. On the CT of this patient right here, there's an avulsion fracture, and peroneus longus and brevis tendons are dislocated and then trapped between the fracture fragment and the rest of the lateral mandibles. Um, we will, uh, so we will look at how different uh, types of fracture um, I risk for uh, I at risk for vascular compromise. So again, as we said, um, with type one, you can get interruption of blood supply from the dorsolateral sources. Uh, type two is also affecting because their subtalar joint is dislocated. It's affecting the inferior sinus tarsi and tarsal canal blood supply. Um, Type three basically disrupts everything, and of course, um, and of course, type type four uh, disrupts all the blood supply to the uh, tailor neck and the tailor body. But also, type four can lead to um, 
osteonecrosis of the table. So what are the signs of osteonecrosis? We see, with time, we see increased density uh, of the Taylor dome, but the contour is maintained. So far, so good. Um, in this case, there's an interesting finding, and this fracture is not really Taylor neck, but this is a Taylor body fracture, predominantly a sagittal plane. The fracture was fixed, and the medial part of the talus has normal demineralization and some demineralization subcortical. This is something that's called Hawking sign. And in this case, the Hawking sign is partial, meaning that the medial part of the talus is alive and uh, the lateral part is dead, mostly dead. So if in some cases, this can progress to collapse of the articular surface and uh, collapse can occur at the Taylor dome or subtalar facet. It can lead to fragmentation and ultimately the um, ultimately what happens is secondary osteoarthritis. I'm going to show you the image of complete Hawking sign just to, just to show you this is a complete Hawking sign. This is going to mean that there's no osteonecrosis there. So let's see how our patient did. This was, remind, so remember this was a 47 year old lady who smoked weed and then texted. And so she's got a close comminuted fracture with the line through the neck. Her Taylor body fragment is rotated and stuck between the posterior malleolus and the calcaneus and the uh, tibial talar and talar calcaneal joints are dislocated. She also has a medial malleolar fracture that are often present with this type of injury. As we just mentioned, all three routes of blood supply are disrupted. So osteonecrosis is very likely and the fracture is at risk for non-union. We will pay particular attention to the soft tissues and in this case, um, our patient got posterior tibialis tendon and flexor digitorum longus partially entrapped uh, between medial malleolar fracture fragment and the uh, body of the talus. And additionally, what we see is a lot of blood and uh, fluid in the tarsal tunnel, which can lead to neurovascular compromise. So let's see how she did. So, um, the patient could not be reduced. Close reduction could not be attempted. It took several tries, but they finally reduced it. They fixated the medial malleolar fracture and they fixated the Taylor neck fracture. And even though there is a little bit of osteonecrosis, right? There is no articular surface collapse and the fracture seems to be uh, healing at least somewhat. So, in conclusion, I'm still okay for time. In conclusion, the tail and neck fractures are often accompanied by malalignment. The classification does have a prognostic value, so we should carefully describe um, what malalignment has occurred. The high grade uh, injuries are associated with various complications, and we should definitely look for associated soft tissue injuries such as uh, tendon entrapment and uh, red macular tears and such. Well, I thank you all for your attention. My email is displayed and uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Yulia. Beautiful case, beautiful review. Let's move on here to Dr. Paulo Elito. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Paulo Elito. He's a musculoskeletal radiologist at Hospital Sirio Libanês, and he is the current section head of MSK Radiology at Hospital das Clínicas of the University of Sao Paulo. He graduated with a degree in medicine from the University of Sao Paulo a medical residency in radiology and diagnostic imaging, a fellowship in MSK radiology, and a doctorate de degree in medical sciences at the Instituto de Radiologia 
from the Clinical Hospital of the University of Sao Paulo. He has co-authored book chapters and authored and co-authored several papers on MSK radiology, orthopedic imaging, and other areas, including imaging of the spine, neuromuscular disorders, and rheumatology. He's an active participant of the uh, Sociedade Paulista de Radiologia, which is the Radiology Society of Sao Paulo, where he has coordinated the MSK group from 2017 to 2019. And he's also a board certified radiology, radiologist member of the Brazilian College of Radiology. Please, Paulo, share your screen. Okay, thank you, Aline, for the kind introduction, and thank you, Aline and Hilary, for the invitation. Again, it's a great pleasure to present a case in, in this meeting. I'll try to keep the high level of the cases uh, with this amazing case from Yulia, and I'd like to say that I do not have a favorite bone in the body, and I'd like to know what is Julia's favorite bone since Talos is the second one. So uh, I'm going to present a case of major trauma. I work here uh, in Sao Paulo in two hospitals. Uh, hospital Ciro Libanese is, is a private hospital and Instituto de Ortopedia and uh, Hospital das Clinicas is a public tertiary hospital that is referenced for uh, a lot of uh, high energy traumas in the city of Sao Paulo. And we have a lot of motorcycle accidents. And uh, I'm going to share one case uh, that is actually from the private uh, hospital, but it could easily be one in the public one. So let's go. Uh, let's start with the clinical data. I'm going to, uh, this case was a 33 year old male that suffered a motorcycle accident. Uh, he presented some fractures in the uh, right upper extremity, uh, including an open fracture in the right humerus and some closed forearm fractures, and also had suspected right brachial plexus injury. Uh, in the physical examination, he presented a complete motor and sensory deficits of the upper extremity. So uh, no movement and complete anesthesia of the upper arm of the right arm, sorry. And he also had pain and deformity in the right arm where he had a for, uh, the arm and in the forearm where he presented the, the fractures with an open wound near the right humerus fracture. And he also presented uh, decreased uh, distal pulses in the upper extremity, but with normal perfusion. The initial workup was some uh, computed tomographies that included a spinal CT that uh, depicted no fracture. Uh, in the axial images, we can see that there was no abnormality in the spinal bones, no clear abnormality of the dural sac, and uh, but we can easily see that there is a lot of uh, muscle enlargement and some fat stranding in the right side of the neck that extends to the right shoulder that we'll appreciate more in the subsequent uh, tomograms. Uh, some images of the right humerus fracture. So we can see in the three-dimensional reconstruction that there was a complete segmentar fracture of the diaphysis. And in the coronal reconstruction, we can appreciate the fracture and also the abnormalities in the soft tissues related to the open wound. We can also uh, see, but not with uh, that detail because it's a bone window, that there is a lot of uh, soft tissue abnormalities associated with this fracture. So this patient underwent a whole body CT and in the CT, there, there was an arterial phase image, and we could see that uh, very interesting findings here. So there is a lot of uh, enlargement of the muscles and fat stranding here in the right 
uh, shoulder and in the right neck. And if we, uh, if we follow the arterial branches, especially the subclavian artery, we can see that there is a, an abrupt stop in the flow of the subclavian artery near the costal clavicular space. So here you can see that there is no flow distal to the costal clavicular space. There is a lot of fat straining and uh, related to hematoma here in this region. We do not see the axillary artery. And more distally, we see the uh, flow in the, in the distal uh, shoulder, or you can see the axillary artery just here. So there is a large gap of absence of flow in the subclavian and, arter and axillary arteries. So there is a complete lesion of the, those uh, of this arterial branch. There is a late uh, image of the same patient. So this is an enhanced late acquisition and we can uh, appreciate the extravasation of the contrast median to the axillary region related to an active uh, bleeding of this arterial injury. So this is the reason why there is a lot of hematoma in the right cervical and the right shoulder regions. So this is a uh, very severe uh, arterial injury, arterial section. Uh, in the 3D maximum intensity uh, project and reconstruction. Uh, in the coronal plane, we can appreciate the discontinuity and the absence of flow in the subclavian and the proximal axillary artery related to this injury. So this patient underwent immediately to surgery. Uh, so uh, he went first to a intravascular reconstruction of the right uh, subclavian artery disruption. So I, I've selected some images. Uh, vascular imaging is not my uh, speciality, but I, I don't think there is much challenge here because there is an abrupt stop in the flow of the, of the subclavian artery. And he, he performed an intravascular reconstruction of the, of the subclavian and proximal uh, axillary artery. So this is the vascular outcome. And he also corrected the fractures and fixated them with a metal hardware. Since he had a uh, complete anesthesia and motor deficit of the right arm, the clinicians and surgeons were very anxious to perform some imaging of the brachial plexus. And two days after the trauma, two days after the right uh, arterial reconstruction, he performed an MRI of the brachial plexus and cervical spine. There was no cord abnormality, although there was, there was some, uh, some fluid here in the epidural space. There was no uh, cord spinal cord abnormality and no uh, preganglionic, no rootlet disruption. In the, the sagittal stir images, we can see that there was a lot of edema in the uh, muscles and also in the fat of the subcutaneous and the fat around the brachial plexus and vascular structures of the supraclavicular region. And we could not uh, define the branches of the brachial plexus. We could not define uh, the spinal nerves, the trunks, divisions, cords. So there was a very, a lot of difficulty to identify the structures since the edema uh, with high signal limits the individualization of the nervous structures. But also we suspected that there was absence of some uh, neural structures, but very difficult to, to say which one was uh, ruptured. Also, so these are some uh, images with uh, higher zoom that you can see that we cannot individualize the structures of the brachial plexus near the in the interscalene uh, space or supraclavicular region. And distally, we could see some amorphous tissue, possibly some uh, neural structures here uh, 
with abnormalities of the with disrupted or abnormal anatomy. The coronal stir images, we also uh, always perform some coronal uh, stir images post gadolinium so we can uh, see the neurostructures. It was very hard to define the, the, neuro, the neural branches because of the edema of the soft tissues. And this is a maximum intensity projection that, that is uh, practically useless. We can see some of the left brachial plexus components here, but the right is almost impossible to, to individualize. So in this moment, we uh, talked to the clinicians and surgeons and oriented them to perform a new MRI of the buccal plexus in around one month after the trauma. And this is, uh, those are the images of this new MRI. So no spinal cord and no uh, intradural abnormalities of the rootlets. Uh, some sequential stir images we can see from C5 to T1 spinal nerves, they are enlarged and with hypersignal. So they are up present, but abnormal. We're going to advance more laterally to see that there is abnormal signal in the spinal nerves. Some are enlarged and some, are very, uh, some present very high signal around the, still in the supraclavicular space, but uh, here in where we would see the formation of the trunks, we do not see the middle trunk, uh, neither the, or the C C7 spinal nerve or the middle trunk. And we start to see some attenuation of the signal of the spinal nerves or the formation of the upper and lower trunk. And there is absence of neural structures in more distally, the, the, where we will see the formation of the trunks. No structures in the supraclavicular or heteroclavicular space. No structures here in the costoclavicular space. Absence of neural structures. And more distally in the infraclavicular space, we see the stumps of the neural structures uh, that are distally retracted and have enlargement and this tortuosity uh, of, the, of its anatomy. We also can appreciate the muscle changes re uh, related to the denervation. So this is acute denervation with hypersignal and no significant uh, volume reduction. And in this maximum intensity coronal image uh, reconstructed from the stir post contrast images, we can easily appreciate the degree of the injury of the bra right brachial plexus with a complete disruption of the superior, middle, and inferior trunks. And the stems are here more distally retracted in the retro in the infraclavicular space with abnormal signal and uh, thickening. So this patient as this patient's final diagnosis was a traumatic subclavian artery injury and complete brachial plexus post ganglionic injury. Uh, just to uh, so uh, just to say what was uh, this patient was uh, uh, this patient still hasn't been operated, but uh, we will we'll see that these patients have very poor prognosis. Uh, and the, what will prob probably be made for this patient is to try to say some function of the right arm uh, with uh, sural nerve uh, interposition in the injury. So he can have some abduction and some flexion of the, of the arm, but probably uh, with very bad prognosis. This, this case has some teachings. So the first one is the association of brachial plexus and arterial injuries. Uh, this, varies a lot, uh, this varies a lot in the literature, but arterial injuries may occur in 10 to 35% of uh, brachial plexus injuries. In our experience, there is, this, uh, these injuries are not as frequent as 35%. We see a lot of brachial plexus injuries maybe 10%. We're talking about uh, any upper extremity injury, not 
uh, exclusive subclavian and axillary arteries injuries, but uh, we still, I still don't believe that it's as high as 35%. Those injuries, those arterial injuries are more common in open injuries and infraclavicular injuries, and they are associated with upper extremity fractures. The brachial plexus injuries are usually more severe when there is an arterial injury, pro probably because uh, this represents a high energy trauma, a trauma with a lot of energy that is enough to disrupt the, the, arter the arteries and also, uh, and so it will have a greater injury of the brachial plexus. And the concomitant vascular injuries are associated with worse function outcomes, which is, uh, uh, which makes a lot of sense because they're higher grade, uh, higher energy traumas. This case also has higher risk of amputation and even death. Regarding the arterial injuries, the clinical evaluation is uh, very important because the distal pulses will be diminished or absent. And usually there is a lot of hematomas, but you should always pay attention to the arterial uh, structures in the MRI of the brachial plexus, especially because, uh, especially to look for absence or discontinuity of the arteries, look for hematomas or even pseudoneurysms. And uh, if a more chronic case is present, we may see collateral circulation, well-established collateral circulation. Regarding the MRI timing, our case represents well that early imaging has several limitations and, the MR, and there is no need to rush uh, the MRI acquisition because surgical intervention window for most of the cases is from three to six months, unless there is a uh, direct section of the, of the brachial plexus. And then uh, imaging must be performed as er imaging and surgery must be performed as early as possible. Since uh, there is a lot of post-traumatic abnormalities, so th there is a lot of perineural edema and there is a lot of uh, anatomy distortion. Early imaging is very limited. Also, uh, for pre-ganglionic uh, injuries, pseudomeningo cells will be uh, more well formed uh, in after about a month, and also the innervation will be more obvious. So MRI is usually delayed about a month after the trauma, uh, unless there is need to to a very readily intervention. Regarding the anatomy, I'm not gonna uh, review all the anatomy of the brachial plexus because I will not have time, but we, we usually perform steady state images to evaluate the preganglionic uh, rootlets. And we perform some images uh, to evaluate the post-ganglionic brachial plexus, including the spinal nerves, trunks, divisions, cords, and terminal branches. So uh, we usually perform a coronal stir image post-contrast where we can uh, see both of the brachial plexus and compare the, the signal and also uh, see very well the anatomy of the neural structures uh, with maximum intensity projections. And this is some uh, very brief review of the anatomy. So we have from C5 to T1 spinal nerves. More distally, they will form the superior, middle, and inferior trunks. More, uh, they will form the divisions, and then they will form the cords. The lateral cord is more anterior, the posterior is more superior and the middle cord is more posterior. I, we usually use the mnemonic lipoma. So the L is anterior, the P is superior, and the M of the middle is more posterior. Uh, we usually evaluate well the, very well the surrounding fat of the structures because the preserved, the normal brachial plexus will preserve the, the surrounding, the perineural fat. And here are the distal branches in the infraclavicular space. So the tips is always to compare the, the brachial plexus 
uh, with the contralateral, especially in the coronal images. I look for the continuity and the fascicular pattern of the nerve structures and, and always look, look at the perineural fat. Regarding the injuries, we always correlate with function, with clinical examination and muscle denervation. So we always have to know which structure uh, innervates what. Regarding the innervation, the, the acute denervation presents with hypersignal and no fatty replacement and no atrophy of the muscle. And the chronic denervation presents with fatty uh, deposition and a lot of atrophy and still can have some, some edema in the fluid sensitive sequences. The trauma of the brachial plexus can be divided in uh, adult and obstetric. I'm going to talk, show some cases of adult as there as was in our case. Some pre and post, it can be divided in pre and post ganglionic, and pre ganglionic has usually worse prognosis. And we can look for discontinuities or intact fibers. The pre ganglionic, as I said, we're going to evaluate the avulsion or discontinuity of the rootlets and some spinal cord abnormalities. Pseudomeningo cells are usually associated with uh, rootlet, rootlet avulsion and some denervation. So some examples, a pseudomeningo cell, a complete discontinuity of the red left rootlets in this steady state images. This is a very interesting case with several pseudomeningo cells in the left brachial plexus, discontinuity of the rootlets and herniation of the spinal cord through the dural defect. This is very, uh, unusual to see. And you can appreciate the distal stump that is usually retracted. Uh, and so this is a discontinuity of the left rootlets and the distal stump is here retracted in the costal clavicular space. Regarding postganglionic injuries, there we usually look for thickening and abnormal signal, anatomy distortion, in late cases, we can see neuroma formation. And in acute phases, we can see extrinsic compressions due to uh, hematomas. So this is a case of a left uh, first coastal fracture in a patient that underwent a heart surgery and woke up with numbness in the left hand. Uh, so there was a fracture of the first rib and also a postganglionic abnormality of the uh, C, C8 root of the brachial plexus. This is a more severe case, a, a car trauma with uh, preganglionic injury and also postganglionic with thickening of the spinal nerves and some discontinuities. So we have to differentiate between thickening and discontinuity because discontinuity has, has worse prognosis. Also, a car accident with some preganglionic uh, rootlet discontinuity, pseudomeningo cell formation. And here you can see, as in our case, the distal stumps of the brachial plexus retracted more laterally. And this is remembers a lot of our, our case. This is a coronal maximum intensity projection where we can see that there is some continuity in the C5 and C6 spinal nerves complete discontinuity of C7 and C8. And there is a, disrupt, a disruption of the T1 uh, spinal nerve and inferior trunk of the brachial plexus with retracted, thickened, and with abnormal signal of the distal stumps. In this case, we can uh, very easily appreciate in the 3D reconstructions, the same findings, the continuity of the superior trunk, the discontinuity, of the C7 and C8 with the pseudo meningo cell in C8 and the discontinuity of the distal T1 and inferior trunk with the retracted distal stumps. So uh, our take home messages, exams should always be interpreted in conjunction with, with clinical data. Our patient presented some uh, decreased distal pulses and this was very obvious that he would have some kind of arterial injury. And he had uh, he that he presented uh, a subclavian complete injury. You have always to pay attention to the arteries. There is there are articles saying that uh, brachial plexus injuries are uh, associated with 
arterial injury is in up to 35%, although I think this is a lot, they are present. And the brachial plexus anatomy is not that difficult, uh, but I always keep some, some anatomy guides and this is not considered cheating. And, uh, we should always look for anatomy guides because some, sometimes this anatomy may be complex and overwhelming and looking at some guides may, may make it easier or make you relax and, and report with more clarity. So I'd like, again, to thank uh, Hillary and thank Alini for the invitation. And I hope my case was as interesting as Julius. And those are my contacts. Uh, I'm always very open to contacts, so you, you can send me an email. It'll be a pleasure, a pleasure to answer. So thank you again. And that's the end of it. Thank you, Paulo. That was uh, that was an amazing case and a very thorough discussion. Um, it's now my great pleasure to introduce uh, my very good and uh, longtime friend and uh, travel partner, Rosemary Klecker. She's associate professor of radiology <clears throat> at the University of South Alabama where she's chief of musculoskeletal imaging and chair of the curriculum department uh, development in the department of radiology. She did her medical school training at George Washington University and completed radiology residency at the Ohio State University and musculoskeletal fellowship at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston, Massachusetts. She's presented at the RSNA, Society of Skeletal Radiology and American Rank and Race Society and is published in seminars in MSK Imaging and Radiographics. Okay, Rosemary, finish us off. All right, well, thank you so much for that um, kind introduction and the invitation to be able to present. And I will share my screen here. There we go. Share that. All right, so let's go back one. All right, well, there we go. So um, again, thank you again for the uh, invitation to present here. And my presentation is gonna be a little bit less high tech than other presentations, but topic I find um, we see a lot of here um, and not just here, but I think um, everywhere, uh, gunshot wounds and ballistic type injuries. So I'm gonna present and what um, made me want to present this one was this case that presented um, to our board somewhat recently. And as I always tell the residents to go back to look at the priors. So this was a 62 year old male who presented with a gunshot wound to the right ankle. And these are the radiographs that he came in with um, in 2019. So you see the right ankle, we see that the ballistic injury with the metallic fragmentation um, is actually located, some of it's embedded within the bone, but it's also located within the joint, the ankle joint here. So don't see any obvious large displaced fracture, the tailored neck looked fine on the CT and on these examinations. Here's a weight bearing examination. And this is an, um, another examination, same patient, a little bit later. Um, so uh, October, 2019, we see the ballistic fragments within the joint. There is a joint effusion. Um, but now we're starting to see a little bit more of these um, degenerative changes, fairly rapid degenerative changes at the ankle joint associated with this ballistic injury, interarticular ballistic injury. So just to compare, this is the one from January and this is one from October, a few months later. So in the lateral view, see um, if you can appreciate, there is a little bit more fragmentation, a little bit of migration of the interarticular ballistic fragments. And there is subtle but progressive osteoarthritic change at the ankle joint. So we have a CT here. And this one also from October, and you can see the degenerative changes with the subchondral cystic changes, the um, changes the subchondral bone with the loss of the cartilage on the CT noted by progressive joint space nearing and irregularity of the contour of the bone here. So some fragmentation here, 
and then intraosseous uh, cystic changes. So with the patient underwent uh, arthroscopy to remove some of the interarticular bodies and um, evaluate and some of the uh, fragmentation of the bone from the talus that came off to um, give a little bit more pain relief. And so here we go, from April, still have some of the interarticular bodies, but as you can see from April of 2022, we have progressive osteoarthritic changes. This is the CT, a little bit more noted on here, significant progression of the osteoarthritic change. Not so much of the um, joint effusion, but we still have the interarticular bodies and the intraosseous bodies. We're lining the joint here with the progressive degenerative change. And this is the CT that we, um, the residents I looked at on the board, the CT going back in here. So what was noted was the pattern almost looks like a lead orthogram in some respects. We still have parts of the fragmentation of the bullets of the ballistic injury within the joint, delineating the joints within the bone. And now we can see going back and looking at the priors, what a significant change there is. Um, in this angle joints, just basically bone and bone articulation and the subchondral cystic changes or subchondral geodes with hibernation or sclerosis of the articular surfaces and osteophytes. And there is also, there's been some progression, although to a lesser extent of the subtalar articulation as well. And here we have on the axial uh, image here. You can see a little bit more of the detail of the Taylor dome, the interarticular bodies, some of the uh, synovial reaction, and also in the uh, tendon sheath here. So ballistic injury. Um, I want to talk about this because this number, um, it shocked me and it didn't shock me a little bit, but, and I think it's probably a little bit higher than this, but statistics say about 100,000 um, are wound, uh, wounded by gunfire every year in the United States. Um, conventionally, the practice um, is to leave, uh, leave the bullet in place. That's usually, that decision is usually made if it is extra articular, if there is, um, if the fracture is not complex, um, or if it's in the soft tissues. However, this practice is being reevaluated. Um, because of the possibility of lead poisoning. So lead poisoning is more common when that bullet is interarticular, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. Every bullet injury is different, depending on the gauge of the bullet um, and the range. So if you can have a nine millimeter bullet that remains intact or bush up that remains intact, and if it's not within a joint, it's usually left to its own device. Um, rarely will that um, capsule leak and cause lead poisoning if it's extra articular and there's no fragmentation. However, if you have a caliber from uh, a high caliber weapon and you have more fragmentation, of course, you're gonna increase the surface area. Um, you're gonna have a higher risk of lead contamination and particularly if that is within a serous cavity or within the joint. Um, which would propagate um, and um, potentiate the possibility for lead poisoning, as well as cause the reactive synovitis or lead synovitis. So how is lead poisoning? So lead poisoning is still remains the most common disease of toxic environmental origin in the United States. And this is from a couple of different reasons. Um, prolonged ingestion, lead paint chips, um, uh, with, uh, within older paint, um, older houses, contaminated water, as we saw most recently in Flint, Michigan. Um, and also in my reading, I almost forgot about this. I remember reading about this in my residency, probably because I was at Ohio State, close to West Virginia and Kentucky, but moonshine malady, um, which the contaminations of the lead from the canary when you make moonshine can seep into the alcoholic beverage of choice and also in some ceramics. Um, inhalation of fumes, um, such as burning of storage batteries, can um, potentially expose someone to lead intoxication. 
And then of course the, uh, it's infrequent, but increasing in frequency because of the increasing in ballistic injuries, um, the absorption of metal from the bullets or buckshot. And again, these fragments, the increased possibility of lead poisoning or lead contamination increases um, if these fragments are contained within a serous cavity or even within the joint. So <clears throat> what happens when you get shot? So you have a soft tissue or osseous injury, a simple or complex comminuted fracture. Usually the simple fractures, the bullets left in place, especially if there's no fragmentation. There's potential vascular injury, in which case the bullet is removed. Infection, just because the bullet comes out at a high rate and it is hot when it comes out, it does not mean that it is sterile when it enters the body. There's always a risk for infection and that uh, risk increases if that bullet is within the joint. So when it's in the joint, you have the increased risk of the infection. You also have the potential for the synovitis, reactive synovitis. Um, you can also get a pseudotumor. You have those metal fragments and there have been case reports of pseudotumor um, product, uh, production um, in the soft tissues with the osseous changes adjacent um, periarticular location. So how do we know about lead poisoning, right? So the symptoms can be quite vague um, and someone can have a bullet um, in their body for a long time and the symptoms may uh, occur very abruptly, even after that chronic subclinical um, um, poisoning of the bullet. So the findings can be intermittent and um, they can be exasperated by secondary issues such as thyrotoxicosis or even hyperparathyroidism or acidosis or infection. The symptoms do include anemia, encephalopathy, nephropathy, neuropathy, and abdominal pain. Now, all these symptoms are quite vague and not specific. So I think there needs to be a more um, awareness to patients coming in uh, with uh, these types of vague symptoms, um, particularly when they do, when we do uh, find that they have lead in their body, bullets in their body, fragments um, in the bodies, particularly within the joint. So, the intraarticular shrapnel, it, it leads to um, a cytovitis, although it's, um, it can, it's not quite as inflammatory as you see in other synovitis. It's a lead synovitis. You can get lead fragment deposition within the synovial lining, um, and you can get a lead type arthrogram as the fragments move around the joint and settle into the synovium. Um, it's a lot of times if you tap these joints, the synovium um, turns out to be gray um, and it still is um, an inflammatory reaction to some sort, although you get more of a rapid osteoarthritic rather than an erosive type changes that you would see with an inflammatory arthropathy um, in the presence of the synovitis, lead synovitis. And of course, the presence of the metallic fra fragments are going to uh, lead you to the, uh, the culprit right there. So here we have the picture as um, a little bit more chronic picture of the fragmentation here. And as you can see, the osteoarthritic type changes with the subchondral geodes and the hibernation and just joint space narrowing. So another patient, um, another joint with a larger bullet fragment and smaller fragmentation in the shoulder. Presentation in 2015, this patient did get a comminuted fracture of the shoulder and somewhat delayed healing that complicated by osteomyelitis with this fragmentation here. You can see the bullets that did heal somewhat as time passes on. Here's one from 2019, it definitely looks a lot bigger, but this is migrating and it continues to shed these particles in here. So it's still a chronic exposure to lead like toxicity, and this patient did have elevated um, levels of lead, went in and um, had a total shoulder re revision and tried to get as much as this lead out of the, the joint as possible or, or in the soft tissues as possible. But obviously the big bullet's gone. So, so a couple of references in really small print that <laughs> you can read over um, 
a little bit later. And that is all I have to um, say. I, again, I want to thank you for your attention and the opportunity to speak. Thank you, Rosemary. Thank you very much, beautiful cases. Um, so we have a question from Eduardo Brown, and it's to Paulo. He's asking, what's your MRI brachial plexus protocol? Is it different from trauma, inflammation, or tumor? Uh, so we usually perform a standard protocol, and we may adapt the protocol to some uh, specific uh, cases. So the main protocol is usually T1 and stir sagittal images, uh, a coronal 3D sequence, usually post gadolinium, a coronal T1 with fat saturation, uh, also 3D, and diffusion weighted images. So we can do some uh, maximum intensity projections. Uh, for traumatic cases, we usually add a steady state T2 to a sequence to access rootlet avulsions. And uh, we also perform T2 sequences of the cervical spine in the sagittal plane and in the axial plane. That's about it. Uh, if there is thoracic outlet syndromes, we perform the arm abduction acquisitions. And for tumor and inflammation is basically the standard protocol. So uh, unless there, there is some special nerve, occipital nerve or uh, thor long thoracic nerve, we perform the, the standard protocol for most patients. Okay, thank you. Uh, I don't see any more questions here. So I will thank you all. Hillary, do you want to? say anything okay so thank you all we are going to uh take a, a break on july um vacation break and then we are gonna go uh, and we are gonna resume it on august and i will let you all know on instagram and twitter so thank you for joining us today and have a great day bye-bye bye-bye thanks everyone bye-bye thank you